Um, I'll be speaking about Laplace eigenfunctions, so this talk falls in the realm of spectral geometry, but uh, I'm not going to be talking about eigenvalues though. So well, this is not a talk about spectral rigidity, it's more a talk about how eigenfunctions of the Laplacian behave. So I'm going to start introducing the setting. So we are going to work on a compact Riemannian manifold. We are going to assume it has no boundary and throughout the talk I'm going to write little n for the dimension of the manifold. Now um, the manifold is compact, so you have the Laplace operator acting on it and the, the, um, the spectrum of the Laplacian is discrete. So if this is the standard Laplacian, I put a minus sign in front to turn it into a positive definite operator. We are going to denote by phi lambda j the eigenfunctions. All the eigenvalues are positive, and I'm going to be writing phi lam uh, lambda j square for the eigenvalues. And because, again, the manifold is compact, you can form an orthonormal basis of L2 of the manifold when you endow L2 with the Riemannian volume form um, by this using these eigenfunctions that throughout the talk I'm going to take to be normalized. So um, the reason why I'm interested in studying eigenfunctions is because they encode all the dynamic and geometric properties of the underlying manifold. Uh, from a quantum mechanics point of view, if you want to understand what's the probability that a quantum particle belongs to this region A in space, what you do is you grab the square of the modulus of the eigenfunction and you integrate it over A. And then you get the probability of your particle being in that region of space. So eigenfunctions, they carry all this information about the underlying manifold and they reflect a lot of what's happening with the dynamics of the geodesic flow. So just to illustrate that point, uh, I have this picture here, you have a disk and a cardioid and in red what you see is the trajectory of a geodesic in each of these two uh, surfaces. And uh, well, there is a big difference here, this one looks quite chaotic. And in these four plots, you have the density plots of four different eigenfunctions, the eigenvalues growing in this direction. And what you're seeing here is the plot of the modulus square of the eigenfunction. So you're seeing this function plotted. Black means that the eigenfunction has, uh, that the modulus is high, while white means that you're getting a zero there. So for example, in these pictures here, it looks like uh, the probability of my particle being near the center, uh, it's zero or very small. Uh, for example, in these two, my particle is going to be concentrated near the boundary. <coughs> while here, where the geodesic flow is highly chaotic, it looks like the region is becoming evenly grayish, which would mean that the probability of finding the quantum particle in any region A in this cardioid would be uh, comparable to the area of the region. So um, this is one way in which AM functions keep track of what's happening with the dynamics of the underlying manifold. And um, this talk is going to focus on two th aspects of eigenfunctions, the critical points and the zero sets of the eigenfunctions. You can think of critical points, if you think of maximums and minimums, as the places where this modulus square is the greatest, so those are the most likely places for your quantum particles to be found at, while zero sets are going to be the least likely places for these quanti quantum particles to be at. And uh, what I wanted to do before starting to talk about which kind of questions we are going to ask uh, was to give you some pictures of how serial sets look like. And uh, the standard thing is to show you a video of the Kladny plates experiment. So here in this video, what you're going to see is um, a metal membrane that's put, it's placed on top of a speaker. This speaker is uh, connected here to a frequency generator. And uh, what you're going to see is that for different frequencies, uh, this membrane is going to start vibrating and what they just did was to put very thin grains of sand on top of the plate. So uh, the frequencies are appearing here in this corner, you'll see, yeah. And uh, what's happening is for each different frequency, these frequencies are associated to standing waves, so they actually correspond to eigenfunctions. So the wave function with which this membrane is vibrating, it's an eigenfunction whose uh, value lambda is this one here on the corner. And what happens is the membrane is vibrating and the places where it doesn't vibrate at all, those places are attracting the grains of sand. 
So those places are the zeros of these eigenfunctions. So what you're seeing is just different zero set configurations of eigenfunctions for these different values of lambda. And uh, you can see that as uh, the frequency gets larger and larger, the configurations become much more complicated. Uh, this was an experiment done first in, I think it's 1680 by Hook. He did it at that time with a metal plane and a violin bow. Uh, and then it was replicated 100 years later by Kladny. And it's since then uh, known as the Kladny plates experiment. He was the first one to record at least 100 configurations of the zero sets. And um, what we are going to do throughout this talk is well, when we are in two dimensions, is to try to understand what the structure of the serial set is. Uh, we are going to talk about how these components are going to be nested within each other. If you look at the complement of the components, uh, those are called noval domains. We are going to try to understand what the connectivity of these components are. And, um, and what I want you to keep in mind is that we are going to be working in this limit where the frequency lambda is going to infinity. So uh, just as a reminder, so lambda j squared is the energy. Lambda j is what I referred refer to as the frequency. Okay, so these are pictures of zero sets on different surfaces so that you don't only have the picture of what happens with a square. This is a quarter stadium, this is a bitorus. Uh, this is a square flat torus, and here you have the round sphere. The lines up here are the serial sets of a high frequency eigenfunction. <coughs> and in the two bottom pictures, what you see is the complement. So in black, you see where the eigenfunctions take positive values, and in white, you see where the eigenfunctions take negative values. So the serial sets in these bottom pictures is just the lines dividing black from white. And um, what I want to do first is to tell you what is it, what do we know about these serial sets? And I'm going to do this in the realm of uh, surfaces, which is what we know the most. So for serial sets, uh, you can prove that uh, they are rectifiable, so you can actually measure their length. And there is this conjecture by STL that says that the measure of the serial set should grow like a constant times lambda, when lambda gets large. Uh, so this conjecture uh, was open for a long time, and very recently Logue now proved this lower bound here. The conjecture says that there should be also a constant up here, but we, don't, we are nowhere close to getting that constant at the moment. Um, what we also know about the serial set is how it spreads across the surface. So we know that there exists this constant C here, such that if you grab a ball of radius C over lambda, no matter where you place it on your surface, it will always intersect the serial set. So what that is saying is that if I start here at a point X in my surface and I walk a distance of C over lambda, then I'm always going to see a sign change in my function. Because these wave functions, they are oscillating at frequencies that are comparable to one over lambda. Um, what we also know is if you take the complement of the serial set, we know that the inner radius of the complement is bounded in between two <coughs> constants over lambda. So there exists this constant here, tiny c, such that if uh, in every nodal domain, you can fit a ball of radius c over lambda. So this is giving you a notion of how thick the complement of the serial set is. And uh, finally, what we also are interested in is in understanding the number of components of the serial set. Uh, in all the pictures that I've been showing you, it looks like the number of components grows to infinity as the frequency grows. Uh, we have no proof of that at the moment. In, a ver in very specific cases, we can show that the number of components goes to infinity, but it's actually quite hard to do. And um, we believe that it should grow like lambda square if you are on a surface, or like lambda to the n if you are on a compact manifold. Uh, but the only thing that we know, and this is a standard result, is Courant's nodal domain theorem that tells you that at most you will have a constant times lambda square number of nodal domains. Okay, so this is what we know on surfaces. Uh, on general manifolds we know even less. And uh, what I'm going to do in my next slide is to tell you what are the questions around which this talk is centered. So we are going to discuss number of critical points of the eigenfunctions. When you divide this by lambda to the n, 
We think that this quotient should remain in most cases bounded above and below by two constants. So the number of critical points should grow like lambda to the n, n being the dimension of the manifold. But there are no results point, uh, that prove anything like that at the moment. Um, the measure of the zero set, as I was saying before, this quotient should remain bounded above and below by two constants. Uh, the number of components of the serial set, and so this is going to be the first part of the talk, and then it's going to get a little bit crazier, and we are going to talk about the different morphism <coughs> types of the components of the serial set, and also about the nesting configurations of these components. Um, okay, so the first thing that you have to do if you're trying to attack these questions is to realize that very little is known. So one of the things that you can do is to try to randomize the problem and instead of answering what happens with these quotients or these quantities uh, for an actual eigenfunction, you can ask what happens for a random eigenfunction. So um, suppose you're working on the n-sphere or on the n-torus, okay, where multiplicities are high, and now fix an eigenvalue. And what you will do is to consider a linear combination of eigenfunctions whose frequencies are equal to the frequency that you started with. Okay? So what this is is just an eigenfunction with eigenvalue lambda square. That's what you just did. But uh, if you pick these coefficients at random, so we are going to allow these coefficients to be standard Gaussians, independent, then what this becomes is a random eigenfunction with eigenvalue lambda square. Um, there it is. Okay, so here in the slide I have a normalizing constant here, 1 over square root n lambda, n lambda being the number of frequencies equal to lambda, so the multiplicity of the eigenvalue. Uh, this is just a normalizing constant, so don't pay attention to it. The point is that you have now these random eigenfunctions, and um, on the on the round sphere they are called random spherical harmonics. On the on the torus, on the flat torus, they are called random arithmetic waves. And uh, the idea is to try to answer these questions, but the, these questions, but now for these random eigenfunctions. So. Um, on the case of the n-sphere and on the n-torus, eigenfunctions can be computed explicitly. We know how they look like, we know their eigenvalues. So you can actually say a lot, and there has been a lot of work done in this direction. So for example, on the two-sphere, uh, there is a series of works by Nicolaescu, Camarota, Maninucci and Bigman that prove that the number of critical points will converge to a constant in probability. So what this means is that the mean is going to a constant, and they can actually show that the variance goes to zero, and they actually, in this last paper, they get a nice rate of decay for the variance. So for the number of critical points, indeed, these quotients are converging to a constant. It's not only that you get, the, get it bounded above and below by two constants, but you actually get convergence in this uh, random realm. For uh, the measure of the serial set on the two sphere, uh, there are computed the expected value of this quotient. And then you Heisel and Bigman control the variance. So they can also show that the variance not only goes to zero, but they get actually really good rates of decay. And you get that the probability of, so in, in you get convergence in probability of these quotients to a constant. So Yale's conjecture is holding in this uh, random realm. So these two first questions are what we call local quantities because you can, if you want to understand the number of critical points or the size of a serial set, you can start with your manifold and you can chop it up in neighborhoods that have sizes comparable to one over lambda and then compute the number of critical points in these tiny walls and then just add them up. Uh, however, you cannot do this with the number of components of a serial set. Because if I have two tiny walls, I may have components that are going from one ball to the other. And you don't want to overcount. And actually, these components will <laughs> definitely go from one ball to the other. Uh, so this is a much harder quantity to study. And there is uh, the work of Nasarov and Soling uh, that they first did on the two sphere. And then they were able to generalize this, where they showed that in mean, 
the number of components of the serial set is converging to a constant. Uh, it, getting the variance is much harder exactly because this is not a local quantity, so they only get convergence in mean. And um, the idea of what I want to do now is to um, start working on these questions, but uh, on a general compact Riemannian manifold where you don't have formulas for the eigenfunctions or the eigenvalues. So that's where we are held. The problem is though that if you want to work on a general manifold, um, if you fix the base manifold and you look at the space of all Riemannian metrics that you can put on it, uh, generically all the eigenvalues are going to be simple. So each eigenspace only has one eigenfunction, so you, do, you cannot do linear combinations of eigenfunctions within an eigenspace. So you will have to re like change this definition. This doesn't make sense anymore. You don't get anything random here. So one thing that you can do is to fix an epsilon, and instead of working with frequencies that are exactly equal to lambda, you can work with frequencies that are in a window from lambda to lambda plus epsilon. Now, so what you're doing is you're incorporating more eigenfunctions to your random linear combination mix by uh, uh, working now with a window from lambda to lambda plus epsilon. So what you just when what you get when you do something like this, when you're working with these random linear combinations, uh, it's a function that has a frequency that's very that's concentrating concentrated near the lambda that you fit that you pick, but it's no longer an eigenfunction, <coughs> right? I'm mixing different eigenspaces. I'm mixing frequencies from lambda to lambda plus epsilon. Um, so that's one of the things that you have to keep in mind from now on. However, we do believe that they should behave like eigenfunctions, that these are an honest model for what eigenfunctions look like. And this is the content of the random wave conjecture by, by Barry, that what it says is that if you're working on a manifold where the geodesic flow is chaotic enough, what happens is that uh, the statistics of <coughs> these waves that are called monochromatic random waves, <coughs> by the way, um, should be the same as that of actual eigenfunctions whose eigenvalues are in these uh, windows, whose frequencies are in these windows. Uh, so what you have here, for example, is just a histogram for the value distribution of an actual eigenfunction whose frequency is 500 on uh, an arithmetic surface. And uh, so you can see that actually, so that, that's those are the points that are plotted. And you can see that it actually adjusts to a Gaussian distribution. And there is uh, some numerical evidence towards this conjecture, but nothing like this has been proved. But uh, just keep in mind that we do believe that these are a good model for how eigenfunctions should behave. And um, so, OK. Suppose we want to un answer these questions for uh, these random waves, and now the question that you need to ask yourself is what do you need to study the number of critical points or the size of the serial set? So these waves that we are considering here, um, since they have Gaussian coefficients, they are called, uh, so they are Gaussian fields on the manifold. And there is this theorem by Kolmogorov that says that Gaussian fields are completely characterized by the two-point correlation function. So if you know the two-point correlation function for your field, you completely understand how the field behaves. You can compute any quantity related to the field. Um, so the two-point correlation function uh, is exactly this. So what you do is you fix two points x and y on your manifold and you compute the expected value of the product of the value of your wave at x times the value of your wave at y. So you are trying to understand how these two values are correlated to each other depending on what x and y are. And uh, because the Gaussians, uh, the variables that we are considering are, are have mean zero, variance one, and are independent, it turns out that this is exactly what you get as your correlation function. So you get the sum of the cross products of the eigenfunctions whose frequencies are in this window. So if you're familiar with Valls law, uh, this is an object that appears a lot um, to compute number of eigenvalues, say, for example, in a window from lambda to lambda plus epsilon, only that what you do is you deal with this object on diagonal and you integrate over the manifold uh, uh, with respect to x. 
But here, if you want to understand these waves, you cannot evaluate on the diagonal and you cannot integrate x out. You actually have to deal with these sums of cross products. What this is, is the kernel of the projection operator from L2 of the manifold onto the direct sum of eigenspaces whose frequencies are in these windows from lambda to lambda plus epsilon. So this is just the kernel of that operator. So if you want to say, yes. Yeah, are you thinking of epsilon as small? Or? It's a fixed small number. Okay, uh, how many eigenvalues do you expect to find in that window? Excellent. So now it, it really depends on, um, on the geometry of the manifold that you're working with. Uh, from now on, I'm going to work under an assumption that says that at least there has to be one point in your manifold uh, for which the measure of geodesic loops that start at that point and close that is, uh, at it, uh, has measured zero. So that under that assumption, you have for that epsilon fix, epsilon lambda to the n minus one again functions roughly in that window. So there are a lot of them. And um, what you need to do, as I was saying, if you want to understand this two point correlation function is to understand the spectral projection operators. And um, if you want to understand actually what happens with the zero set and the number of critical points, you need to understand this two-point correlation function, but at one over lambda scales, because that's where the eigenfunction is, uh, how the eigenfunction oscillates. So the largest correlations are going to happen in those scales. So what you need to do is to be able to, um, so if this is your manifold, and this is a point x that you fix on the manifold. So if we identify it with its tangent space via the exponential map, what we need to do is to work with vectors here that, that are of the form u over lambda, b over lambda, and map them here via the exponential map. So I need to be able to evaluate my two-point correlation function at these points. So one over lambda close to a fixed point x. So what we really need to control is the two-point correlation function evaluated at the image of u over lambda and the image <coughs> of b over lambda. This is the quantity that I need to control as lambda goes to infinity. Um, are there any questions so far? No? Okay, so now, um, as I was saying, to make sure that I have eigenfunctions and to actually be able to prove any result, um, I need to work under the following conditions. So fix the point, uh, point x on your manifold and now look at the space of all initial velocities that generate uh, closed geodesic loops. So it doesn't have to close smoothly, it's just closed, okay? And you look at the set of all possible initial velocities. So you're working <coughs> in SX star M, okay? And uh, here you equip this with the Liouville measure on what you are, the condition that we are going to be working with is that the measure of the space of initial velocities that generate geodesic loops has to be zero, okay? And under that assumption, what we proved together with Boris Honey is that we have a limiting uh, function for this uh, scale two-point correlation uh, for Psi Lambda. So the assumption that we have to work under is that uh, if you fix the point X, the measure of geodesic loops that close at X has to be zero. And under that assumption, we can control that Lambda to the N minus one shouldn't be there, cross it out. The limit of this rescale covariance function is the function uh, that's also going to be the two-point correlation function for a field. So what I'm going to do now is to explain what this psi infinity field is. Uh, so what you get is that this is <coughs> converging to epsilon times the two-point correlation function for a Gaussian random field in Rn. So this psi infinity field is what's called a, superpo a superposition of random planar waves. What, they sat what it satisfies is that it's an eigenfunction for the Euclidean Laplacian with eigenvalue one, okay? 
And uh, since it's the Gaussian field, it's completely characterized by the two-point correlation function. You can actually define it in terms of the two-point correlation function. And the two-point correlation function is exactly this thing that we have here on the right-hand side. So you integrate over the n minus 1 sphere e to the i u minus v against w. So what you have here on the right-hand side <coughs> is actually um, the Fourier transform of the spherical measure. So this evaluated at u b is simply the Fourier transform of the spherical measure evaluated at u minus v. So what we are getting is that no matter what the geometry or the topology of the manifold that you start with is, you, when you rescale the two-point correlation function like this, you get always the same limit. And this limit only depends on the dimension of the manifold. You're integrating over the SN minus 1 sphere. And that's the only thing that you remember about the starting manifold. Um, so this result is true as long as you have this hypothesis. However, I strongly think that it should always be true. Uh, to prove this result, we use micro-local analysis. And so we have to work with the <coughs> wave operator with the wave kernel and we have to propagate the singularities along geodesics and that's why we need this condition in the set of geodesic loops. Uh, but I really think it's a problem of our proof that we have to enforce this condition. I think it should really be true on any manifold. It is true on the sphere and it's true on the torus and the fact that it's true is what allowed all these people to get these results on the n sphere and on the n torus for the number of critical points and uh, the size of the zero set. So um, this, this convergence holds in this infinity topology, so you can take as many derivatives in U and B on both sides as you want, and you still get the limit. And it holds uniformly for U and B uh, inside a wall here in the tangent space of constant <coughs> radius R. Another way of reading this result is that if you start with your wave and you rescale it, so you fix the point X, and uh, you rescale it at one of our lambda ranges about x. So now you, see, you think of this as a function in Rn, and in Rn. So this is a function of u, OK? So as a random variable in Rn, uh, it converges in distribution to these fields, these random planar waves in Rn. That's what this result says, because you have convergence of the two-point correlation function, so all the moments converge. So these random waves really behave like these limiting guys that we have in Rn. And just so that you have an idea of what the heuristics are behind this statement, this is not a proof, and actually it has nothing to do with the proof, <laughs> but uh, what happens is that if you grab an eigenfunction, an actual eigenfunction of the Laplacian, and you fix your point x, and you rescale this function about x, then when if you hit this with the Euclidean Laplacian plus some lower order differential operators that I do not want to define, then what you recover back is the eigenfunction itself when it is scaled. So what's happening is that to living order in lambda terms, um, the rescaled eigenfunctions behave like eigenfunctions of the Euclidean Laplacian with eigenvalue 1. Uh, which is the property that these limiting guys have. So that's, that's what's happening behind the scenes. And this is why, uh, and, and that statement holds on any manifold. So that's why we are getting this universal limit that forgets <coughs> the metric G or the topology of the manifold. Okay, so are there any questions about this statement? What I'll do now is to show you how you can apply this result. Uh, so for example, if you try to count the number of critical points or measure the size of a zero set, we can prove that in mean <coughs> they converge to a constant. These constants, a n and b n, only depend on the dimension. So they are the same for every Riemannian manifold, compact Riemannian manifold of dimension n. As long as you work under this assumption, that what you need is that for almost every point on your manifold, the measure of closed geodesic loops has to be zero. So uh, yeah, that's the assumption. And if you want to control the variance, uh, you actually need to uh, uh, ask for something else. Because when you, when you control the variance, 
you need to control your two-point correlation function in balls that are in points that are very far apart. Uh, for example, picture the sphere, like the values of your function on the north pole uh, should be super correlated to the values of the function on the south pole. So it's not always true that only the one over lambda ranges matter. <coughs> you have to be careful of those things. Uh, so uh, if we work under the assumption that if you for almost every pair of points x and y on your manifold, if you look at the set of arcs, geodesic arcs that are joining these two points, that uh, the set of initial velocities will have measure zero for almost every pair of points, then we can control the variance. And not only we have that it decays to zero, but we can also control the rate. So we have convergence in probability of these two of uh, these quotients to these constants a n and b n. Okay. So now uh, for the second half of the talk, I'm going to start talking about uh, the components of the serial set and their, their number, their diffeomorphism types, and how they are nested. So this is uh, the serial set for actually, it's not for ps uh, Psi Lambda, it's actually for this guy here, Psi Infinity in R3, where we just cut it to a box. This picture is by Alex Barnett. And uh, so when you're working in dimension three, uh, your serial set has dimension two. So it's going to be a surface or actually a collection of connected surfaces. And uh, the limiting guy, the serial set looks like this. So you can really not tell what's going on there. Um, the first question was, can, can I count the number of components of the serial set? And this question was answered by Nassar van Soling. And in mean, if you are working under the assumptions that Boris and I found, you can show that the number of components will converge to, uh, will grow like a constant times lambda to the n. And um, what uh, you can ask after that is, well, what happens if instead of just counting the number of components, what I want to do is to count the number of components with a given diffeomorphism type? Can I say that 90% of my components are always going to be spheres? That's the type of question that we are asking. Um, so let me tell you how we are going to go about thinking of this problem. So suppose you have a realization of C lambda, and these are the components of your serial set. So the manifold has dimension three, the components are a collection of uh, surfaces, and you are going to organize this surface according to their genus. So here I have 10 components in total, I, five of them are spheres, three of them are tori, nothing of genus two and two components of genus three. So what you are going to do is to collect that information into a measure, into a probability <coughs> measure. What this probability measure tells you is the frequency with which each diffeomorphism type is appearing. So five out of 10 times I get a sphere, three out of 10 times I get a torus. And the question is, as lambda grows, is there going to be a universal distribution for my diffeomorphism types? Is there going to be a law that tells me for lambda large enough, 90% of the components will be always uh, will always be spheres, 5% are going to be tori, and so on. Yes? So, I mean, the random, so that this ran random kind of linear combination, zero is a uh, regular value? Again? Oh, yeah, with probability one, it's a regular value. So these are going to be smooth manifolds. But the, I mean, the, the collection of different prism types, of course, depends on the choice of the IJ, H, AJ, yeah? Yes, definitely, yes. So what these are, these are probability measures, but they are random probability measures. For, so for each realization of C lambda, you have a different distribution mm -hmm. of the diffeomorphism types. So let me actually define these measures. So they are probability measures, so they give you back a number between zero and one. And uh, the domain of these measures is the space of diffeomorphism types. So if you grab a component of your serial set, it's going to be a compact manifold. It will have dimension n minus one. It will have no boundary. With probability one, you can show that it's going to be smooth. And with high probability, you can show that it can be embedded in Rn. <coughs> so this is the collection of components that we are looking at. And we are going to quotient this by the space of diffeomorphism types. So that's the domain of the measure. To each diffeomorphism type, I associate the frequency with which it appears among the components of a serial set. 
So in this example, I have one over 10, 10 being the total number of components, and then I'm putting a delta mass every time a diffeomorphism type is hit. That's how the measure looks like in this example. So I have five times the delta mass of genus zero, three times the delta mass of genus one, and so on. And that's in general how you construct the measure. So if I call C, capital C sub C lambda, the collection of all the components in my serial set, then the measure looks like one over the total number of components, and then a sum of delta masses, where I'm going to add a delta mass every time uh, the diffeomorphism type of that delta mass is hit by a component in my serial set. Okay, so the question is again, in the limit as lambda grows, do I have a limiting probability that will encode how these diffeomorphism types look like? And the answer is yes. This is a result by Peter Sarnak and Ior Wigman. Um, so what they show is the existence of this limiting guide, mu infinity, uh, to which the mu psi lambdas are converging. And in the, the way in which they converge is the space of diffeomorphism types is discrete. So to measure the difference between these probability measures, you simply evaluate them on finite subsets of their domain. And, uh, and you can compute the difference. So what this statement says is that for any epsilon fixed, okay, any uh, small epsilon that you pick, the probability that the difference between the two measures be bigger than this epsilon is going to go to zero as lambda grows to infinity. So in that sense, these measures are the limiting guys. And um, the assumption under which you need to be working is that the, for almost every point on your manifold, the measure of closed geodesic loops has to be zero, simply because you need this convergence of the two-point correlation function to prove any result like this. Okay, so now there is a limiting distribution. I have to say two things though. So from the proof of Sarnak and Bingman, you cannot track how this measure looks like. This is an existential proof. They prove the existence of the limiting measure, <coughs> but you cannot keep track of how this measure is built. So you cannot say that 90% of the components are going to be spheres. You cannot hope for anything like that. The second problem is the following. We have no clue what the domains look like for high dimensions. So if the manifold has dimension three, the serial set is a collection of surfaces, so you can definitely organize them by their genus. So in that case, you do know the domain of the measure. But if your manifold has dimension four or higher, then the serial set is a collection of components of dimension three or higher. And we really don't know uh, what the space of diffeomorphism types of such manifolds look like. So we really don't understand the domain of these measures. So that's part of the problem that one has. Uh, but despite of that, uh, what we did with Peter Sandman is to show that the support of the measure is the entire space. So even though we have no clue how this looks like, if you give me a diffeomorphism type uh, with a strictly positive probability, that diffeomorphism type will occur in the serial set of your random waves for a lambda large enough. That's what's happening. You're observing all the possible diffeomorphism types once the frequency is large enough. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do next is to discuss the similar problem of the nesting of the components. So are there any questions about this statement? Yeah. yeah. Like how, well I guess super hard, but how computable would it be to find the limit from an, exa from an example? Uh, like, from an example? Yeah. <laughs> no. At the moment, we really don't know how to find any lower bounds on these probabilities. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. No. Oh, maybe yeah. that's what you're going to There. Uh, yeah. If you restrict to dimension three, and now you have surfaces and you have your limiting measure on, on the <coughs> what we do you know on this measure? We have uh, Alex Barnett running numerical experiments. Uh, what he's observing is that there is going to be a giant component and then tiny components around it uh, that will have uh, these different diffeomorphism types. But actually, in his numerical experiments, he's only being able to see spheres. Uh, so it's very likely that the probability of seeing all the diffeomorphism types are super, super tiny. So comp I mean, at this moment in time, the computers cannot give us any information. Yeah. Uh, yes. 
Yes, so all these statements are about in the end. So if you want to understand this limiting distribution, what you need to understand is the limiting distribution. Uh, it's, it's this kind of Phillips infinity. You need to understand the diffeomorphism types of this guy. And what happens with this guy is that it satisfies this equation. So it's, a, it's, it's quite rigid. It's an eigenfunction for the Laplacian with eigenvalue 1. So uh, it has a lot of structure into it. OK, so now for the nesting of, of the components, if these are the components of your serial set, the way in which we are going to record the nestings is, as, is using a finite rooted tree. So uh, for this tree, the root of the tree corresponds to the big <coughs> nodal domain. Each of the nodes is a nodal domain. So it splits into three pieces. So this nodal domain here, that one, and that one. And then, for example, this one splits in three pieces farther, this, this, and that. Okay. So each nodal domain is one of the nodes in my tree. And you put an edge joining the nodes every time that you have a component of the serial set separating the nodal domains. So you can actually record the nestings in your serial set components using finite rooted trees. And the way in which we are going to record the proportions of the different nestings within uh, your serial set uh, is the following. So to each component of the serial set, so suppose this yellow one, you look at the edge that's associated to it in the tree. And once you remove that edge from the tree, it's going to split the tree into two pieces. And you just grab the smallest one. So we are, we are defining this map that to this yellow component of the serial set, it associates this small subtree here. Or for example, to this blue component here uh, that's associated to this edge, you associate the leaf of the tree. And uh, the way in which uh, you build uh, the probability measure that's associated to the different nestings is simply on the space of finite rooted trees, you put a delta mass every time one of these subtree configurations was hit among the components of your serial set. So it's exactly the same construction of, as before, only that now what you're recording instead of ephemorphism types are these nesting configurations. And the question again is, in the limit as lambda grows to infinity, will they have a, uh, a universal distribution of the nesting configurations? And uh, the answer in this case, again, is yes, there is. In the same paper, Peter Sandnag and Yor Bingman prove the existence of this limiting guy, new infinity, uh, to which the new psi lambdas will converge. So there is a universal distribution of the nesting configurations of the serial set. Once lambda is large enough, there will always be uh, a proportion, a fixed proportion of components that are going to be isolated. And then a fixed proportion of components that will be a bubble inside another bubble, and so on. And what we prove with Peter Sarnak is that the support of the measure is the entire space of trees. Uh, so if you give me any nesting configuration, we can show that uh, for lambda large enough, that nesting configuration is going to occur with a strictly positive probability. That's what we were able to show. And uh, what these statements, this, the proofs of these statements, what they reduce to is actually to working in an end. And uh, what you have to do is to find solutions to this equation, whose serial set contains uh, a collection of components that are nested according to any tree that you make a map with. Or uh, a solution to this equation, whose serial set of components has a, a component with a diffeomorphism type that you like. So that's how, actually, the proofs of these statements on the supports of the measure, what, what they really are about is about working in RN on finding solutions to this equation, uh, for which you can make sure that the serial set will have at least one component with the diffeomorphism type that you want, or at least a collection of components with the <coughs> nesting configuration that you want. OK, and uh, to finish the talk in my last slide, what I wanted to do is to show you the only setting in which we actually understand what the limiting uh, probabilities look like because of numerical experiments. So this is when you work in dimension two. In dimension two, the diffeomorphism types of the components of the serial set are boring. <laughs> it's because it's just you can prove that all of them are going to be embedded circles, the components of the serial set. 
So what you can do instead, which is m way more interesting, is looking at the complement of the zero set. So you have all these nodal domains, each of them with a different color, and you can study the connectivities of these components. So you can count the number of holes that these components have. So for example, this green component here has, a, uh, has another one inside, so one hole for it, that one. Uh, this violet mass here, it looks like it has at least two holes and so on. So you count the number of holes in each component and you ask is there a universal distribution for the number of holes? The answer is yes. And uh, Alex Barnett computed uh, the limiting distribution in this case. So this is the only setup in which we know what the limiting measure looks like. What he's getting is that 91% of the components will have no holes. Uh, about 5% of the components will have one hole. 1% will have two holes. And then uh, they, the, the, the number of components having higher and higher number of connectivity starts decreasing super rapidly. That's what he's observing. His table actually goes all the way up to connectivity 20. And the error, if I remember correctly, was in the fifth decimal place, so you don't even see it here. And this is really the only case in which we understand what these limiting <coughs> probabilities are. In the other settings, the only thing we know is that the support is the full space. And that's it. That's the limit of our knowledge. Um, that's it. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. function psi infinity, does it depend on the manifold or what? No. No, it's the same one for all the manifolds. Uh, what psi infinity is, is a Gaussian random field in Rn that's defined uh, by this two-point correlation function. So Gaussian fields are completely defined by a two-point correlation function. So this Gaussian field is the one that has this two-point correlation function. So you just take the Fourier transform of the spherical measure. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can also, I mean, physicists like to think of it as a superpos superposition of random planar waves. Uh, they are equivalent. And the only information that you have is that they solve this equation. But it's, a, it's just a function in Rn and it has nothing to do with the manifold. It, it's always the same limiting guy, uh, but um, yeah, but it's not connected to the manifold. It forgot it, yeah. Is a question? Yes. Um, when you build your measure mu, mu, counting the types of different morphisms, um, would it be meaningful to ponder it by the um, uh, uh, average measure of each component? The size of the component. The, the size. Yes, definitely. That's actually the right question to be looking at. So Alex Barnett, what he's observing in, in his numerical computations is that he's getting in dimension three or higher. Dimension two is completely different. But in dimension three or higher, he's getting a massive component of the serial set, always. So it looks like there is this percolating component of the serial set, no matter how many experiments he runs, that's eating up the whole space. And then he has like this small isolated components that are then reflecting all the diffeomorphism types that we are seeing. But the main guy, it's uh, this huge component that it's taking most of the volume of the serial set, most of the halves of measure of the serial set. Uh, so yes, definitely, that would be the right question. And the answer would be probably there is this guy that ac it's actually leading the behavior of the serial set. But <coughs> so far, we cannot show that there is a component that's large, actually. In, in dimension two? In dimension two is different because um, this is connected to percolation, so the probability of being able to cross from the bottom uh, side of the square, say, to the top, is the same as crossing it this way. So you, it, uh, it's unlikely that you will have percolating components for the serial set. In dimension three, it's different because to close, the, I mean, to go from one side to the other, you would need to block it with something of dimension two, so it's much harder. So yeah, you, you do have this percolating component, but we have no proof of that. Like, we are far away from a proof of that. Yeah. And by the way, I should say, similar things can be done when you, instead of working with these eigenfunctions, <laughs> when you work with a problem that's slightly easier. So you do the sum from zero all the way up to lambda. 
So you're mimicking polynomials on the manifold and you look at the serial sets uh, and the proofs there are much easier and a lot more can be done. So you can bound from below the probabilities and stuff. Uh, this problem is much more rigid because you have a, an elliptic <laughs> PDE that needs to be satisfied throughout. Yes. Um, both your experimental and your explanation suggest that the number of critical points in a small region uh, is kind of proportional to the volume and, uh, and lambda to the power n of this small region. Mm -hmm. uh, can you show some kind of equidistribution? Uh, so in small scales? Yeah. You mean? So well, we yeah, like you, yeah, does the, the repartition of critical points go, uh, goes yeah. to Riemannian volume or something like that? Yeah, so for the critical points it's hard. For the zeros, so let me explain one thing. So for the zero set, we can show that if I, okay, let me say it in words. So <coughs> fix a ball of radius C over lambda, okay? Uh, fix a C and look at balls of radius C over lambda and look at the serial set inside that ball. So now think of the that serial set uh, and the Riemannian measure that it's induced on it. Okay, let's call it D sigma lambda. What we can prove is that this D sigma lambda will converge in distribution to a D sigma infinity. So in l small scales, you have convergence of this measure. And one, what's crucial to get this convergence in distribution is that we know that in our n, the serial sets of this equation, if you restrict to a bounded ball, it will have bounded measure. So the moments are going to be bounded, so we get convergence of all the moments. For the number of critical points, if you try to do that, we don't really know that the moments are going to be finite. We actually conjecture that uh, at some point, actually, for a high enough moment, it will be infinite, so we, don't, we cannot get this convergence. But we don't really know what happens with the moments. Yeah, but th that's a really a nice question, yes. I think maybe related to that. So for a lot of the local things, there's a common limit distribution that doesn't depend on the manifold. And is that just because everything is, almost everything's starting to happen in really, really small balls that are almost like Euclidean space, so the yeah. distribution is the one so from... So eigenfunctions, they are oscillating like crazy as lambda goes to infinity. So really what's happening is that the larger picture really looks like S to the end one. Yes, that's what's happening. No other question? Yeah. 